Friday night. We had about 23 people there. We're going through uh, 40 Days in the Word by Rick Warren. And uh, we, we have a class, and then you have a workbook, and you have to do something every day in that workbook. You have to memorize scripture. And what is uh, what was yesterday's scripture? First Corinthians 120, I mean, Philippians 127. Anybody know? Right. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Amen. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, once you get God's word in your heart, it, it just transforms you. And that's one thing I like about what Rick Warren said. He said, it's not the translation you use, it's, it's the transformation that happens in God's word in your life. So that's what's important. Well, uh, last week we talked about encouraging yourself in the Lord, how to encourage yourself in the Lord, because a lot of times we just need to be encouraged, amen? And sometimes there's nobody around to encourage us. And so we need to know how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And so that's what I talked about last week. And, and this week I'm going to talk about how you can enter into times of refreshing, times of refreshing. and. A lot of times we need that. Sometimes in our spiritual walk we, we feel like we're dry and, uh, and you know, we, we don't have the Spirit of God uh, flowing in our lives sometimes like we used to. And so we need to know how to come into times of refreshing and let the Spirit of God refresh us. You know, because uh, it's your spirit that, that needs to be refreshed, you're, not your body and, you know, it, it's your spirit because your spirit you know, David, when he was down, he said, Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquiet within me? He said, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. So he spoke to his spirit to be encouraged in the Lord. And sometimes we have to do that. We have to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You have to sometimes, uh, you know, have your flesh, even though your flesh doesn't want to bless God, you have to speak to your spirit and encourage yourself in the Lord to bless God. And this morning I'm going to look at uh, how we can do that, how we come into times of refreshing. And if you look at John uh, 4, verses 4 through 20, I want to read that to you. You see Travis and Allegra back and Arrow. And uh, maybe in the next couple of weeks I'll have them uh, get up and share what God's doing in their ministry. Uh, they're going to be here to November, right? Okay. Amen. Um, I want to encourage you, next, next Sunday is going to be crazy. How many have seen Christoph? He's great. You know, I mean, he'll be up here juggling fire and all kinds of stuff. So that's going to be a great time for kids next Sunday. Let's look at John 4, verse 4 through 20. And he came to Pat, and he, and he had passed through Samaria. So he had came to a town of Samaria and called Sychar, near the field of Jacob, uh, which had given his sons Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus uh, wearied and was, uh, as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samarian woman said to him, How is it that you are a Jew, asked of a drink from a woman of Samaria? They, the Jews really didn't get along with the Samaritans, and she was kind of puzzled by that. For Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living waters. And the woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. And where do you get these living waters? Are you greater than our fathers Jacob? He had gave us the well and drank from it himself, as, he, as his sons and his livestock. Jesus said unto her, 
Every one of you who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him uh, will be in him a spring of water welling up until eternal life. And the woman said to her, him, Sir, give me this water. Amen. So that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And then Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, said, and, uh, answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have right in saying, I have no husbands. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What, have you, uh, what you have said is true. Then the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in the mountains. And it's, it's kind of struck me as like, you know, Jesus was telling her about living water. And she was thirsty. She wanted this water that if she took part of it, that it, it, she would never be thirsty again. And so Jesus is telling her about that. Then he, he kind of hones in on her sin and tells her that, you know, that she's had five husbands. And all of a sudden she thinks, uh, time to change the subject. You know, she says, well, I perceive you're a prophet, you know, and uh, I think we ought to worship here. And, and so she's trying to change the subject. And uh, she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that it's in Jerusalem in a place where people ought to worship. Um, so Jesus was telling her about something that would fulfill her thirst and that she couldn't get from that well. He was saying that he has the living waters, the living waters, and that if she would take part of that living water, she would never thirst again. And you know, there's a lot of, lot of people out there who are thirsty for something, and they'll never be fulfilled until they, they drink of the living waters. And water in the Bible is a typology of life. There's two types of water the Bible refers to. Living waters. And uh, the living water is always fresh and pure and flowing and life-giving. And then there's cistern water, which is dead and stagnant. Uh, they're man-made tanks to hold water. How many of you have ever saw a cistern? I have one in my backyard, and that's the way they, they had water back then. They had cisterns, and the rain would come off your gutters and go into this tank, and uh, they would drink from it. But sometimes you'll find a, a dead animal floating in that cistern. <laughs> Not too inviting to drink from, is it? But when you come to a, a, a stream running with fresh and pure and living water, man, you just want to drink from it. And uh, I remember we used to have some property on the Black River, and I remember going out there, and man, when it was real hot, that water was just so clean and fresh, you could just drink from it, and it was so pure. So there's two types of water the Bible talks about. In Jeremiah 2, 1 through 13, he says this, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim uh, in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth and your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in the land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of, of his harvest. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the claims of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless. He, he's saying at one time you really loved me and, and you walked with me, and, and, but now you're, you're going after different things and you're going after worthless things and you're becoming worthless. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness in the land of deserts and pits and in the land of drought and deep darkness in the land that none passes through, where no man dwells. 
And I brought you into a, a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that did not profit. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot have hold pure water. They've forsaken the pure, life-giving water for polluted, stagnant water. Dead man's cisterns. And cisterns are what you create with your own hands. Cistern diggers are those who trust in their own strength. And the Bible describes life without God as a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And you know, I remember before I got saved and, and I was praying with this guy who was leading me to the Lord, prior to accepting God, I, I closed my eyes and I saw, how many have ever seen uh, ground where it's, it's all dried and parched and it's all cracked and you know, it, there's just, everything is brown and dead. And I saw that, I, I just had a vision of that. As soon as I closed my eyes, when we were getting ready to pray, and, and the Lord was showing me that's the way my life was, dry and thirsty, nothing living. It was dead. And when I accepted the Lord, it was just like waters come flowing into my life and, and living waters of God, and it brought me life. I became alive in Christ. And probably a lot of you have had that same experience. But if you would look at Psalm 63, 1 through 5, David describes this. When you look at somebody in the world who doesn't know Christ, you might think they have it all together. You might, they might have money, they might have a, a, a good job, but they're, it, spiritually they're dry and thirsty. And they're in a land, the world is a land where there is no living waters, no spiritual living waters. And David wrote this in Psalms 63, 1 through 5. He said, O God, O, thou, o God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And we live in the world. We, we're, we're not of the world, but we live in the world. And it's a dry and thirsty land. How many know that you know, when you leave here Sunday, some, you're just encouraged, you feel the Spirit of God, and then you get out in the world and you start working with other people, and uh, you, know, you hear all that cussing and, and things going on and all the worldliness. It gets kind of dry and thirsty out there, doesn't it? And then you come back in, the Bible study or whatever it is. I, I know Thursday nights when I, we had that Bible study, I, I felt refreshed when I left here because we were memorizing God's Word, we're talking about God's Word, we worship together, and I was refreshed. And it was a time of, of getting a drink of living waters in the middle of the week. It's like an oasis in the middle of the desert. And so I, I was I was. I came out of here Thursday night just refreshed in the spirit. And, and that what's, that's what refreshes your spirit is the word of God. You can't get that out of listening to Coca-Cola commercials. It just doesn't do nothing for my spirit. I remember when I was in, we, we went to Texas one year and I thought, man, Sunday I think I'll go to church. And so I went to this, I saw this huge church, you know, something Bible church and I thought man that's got to be a solid church and I went in there and I noticed nobody was carrying their Bibles and I thought that's strange so I went in there anyway and and it looked like an amphitheater they had they had uh, cup holders on each chair seat you know <laughs> and they got up there and they told some cute stories and 
and sang a couple songs. They didn't have worship. Nobody worshipped. And there was thousands of people there. And, uh, and, you know, they sang a couple cute songs and watched a video, and the guy gave up a little talk. And, and then, you know, it was over, and everybody left. And I, I walked out of there, and I thought, man, I could have got more out of watching Mickey Mouse or something because my spirit wasn't refreshed. And, you know, it, it's God's word that refreshes us. And in worship, how many were refreshed in the time of worship this morning? Great, great songs, awesome group of songs you picked this morning. And, and uh, my soul was blessed. I was, I was blessed. I was refreshed. I mean, that's the way we ought to be in worship. If you leave here the same way that you came in, then we missed the mark. You ought to be refreshed. You ought to be encouraged. And so David is saying that my flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. There's no spiritual water outside, uh, outside of God. There's no thirst. There's nothing that's going to quench your thirst, your spiritual thirst, like the spirit of the living God. And then he goes on to see the power and glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You know, you could see God move outside of church just like you see him move inside of church because his presence is with you. And then he says, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. We used to sing that. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Remember that song? That was a good song. And uh, he says, my lips will praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied, shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember upon my bed and meditation of thee in the night watches. You know, we are uh, memorizing these scriptures and, uh, and one of the first methods they tell us to do is the pronounce it method, where you take a scripture like, uh, you know, um, the, the scripture we memorized in, in uh, Philippians 1.27, uh, whatever happens, you know, there's a lot of, and, and you stop there and you just meditate on those two words, whatever happens. You know, you think, well, man, there's a lot of things that happen. And then and it says, conduct yourself, you know. Um, and then you think about that word. And, you know, I encouraged everybody that uh, the, the first scripture that we memorized was in Philippians uh, 1. It's also, it, God is uh, faithful to perform the work that he started in me. And so I encouraged everybody that when they go to bed, that they would just talk, memorize that scripture, meditate on that scripture. You know, because when, when you lay your head on that pillow, all kinds of thoughts and worries and things just are flooding through your mind. Well, David here says that I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. So, you know, you might want to try that. Just meditating on God's word as you get ready to, to go to bed and, and God will, will speak to you through his word. So David said that his soul thirsts for God in a dry and weary land. And David was in the Jordan of wilderness, a barren desert, a barren desert. And I want to give you an illustration of that this morning. Uh, he was in, in, the, in, a, in, a, in the Jordan wilderness, a barren desert, but he came to a very a place called En Gedi. And uh, we're going to try and show that video right now. We've had a lot of problems with technical stuff this morning, but I trust in the Lord and Scott's wisdom back there. <laughs> what an incredibly beautiful place here this morning. Almost like an amphitheater. You look around and up above, not 100 feet from us, you're right out in the wilderness. Incredible. We came up here this morning, and as you enter this canyon, this wadi here in the Judea wilderness, absolute barrenness. Remember the dust by the Dead Sea and the rocks and just a broom tree here and there, and almost like the country is totally barren. 
And then suddenly you come to this place in the jungle and the reeds and the water and the sounds of animals and the ebex running around. Really a glorious, glorious place. To the east of us is the Dead Sea, maybe a mile. We're in the Judea wilderness. To the west of us, the Judea mountains, not all that far. In fact, if you go 10 or 15 miles, you'll be where they're actually doing farming and people are raising crops. It's hard to imagine. And we're in one of those wadi canyons that comes down out of those mountains and runs to the Dead Sea. Now somewhere just up above us here, a little bit further to the west, there's a spring that runs right out of the rock. A stream of water runs a short distance and then comes falling down these stones and makes its way here down the canyon where eventually it's trapped, of course, and used. You wouldn't waste good water. But that's the wadi or the oasis of En Gedi. A couple of Bible contexts in which this is important. David has been hiding out from Saul. We spoke of that at Masada, that fortress. And he's there in the desert going probably from cave to cave and fortress to fortress. And it seems like every place he goes, Somehow Saul finds out, and so David has to move, and he's been living there maybe for months in the barrenness of that desert with those men that he had uh, surrounded himself with and trying to find his escape from Saul, wondering how God was going to finally give him the kingdom that he'd been promised, and you can almost feel that. I want you to feel the heat of Masada, and the burning of the sun, and the, the dust that we felt yesterday in the Negev. Finally, the Bible says, David came here to the strongholds of En Gedi. Hope you can feel the impact that this must have had on them just to feel this refreshing coolness and water and the shade of the jungle. Just an amazing thing. Now, it's based on that kind of experience that the Bible begins to talk about water. Psalms in particular, maybe David was reflecting back on this place or at least some place like it. The first one comes from Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And David thinks, you know, in a way that's what life is like. It's just dry. It's, it's barren. Sometimes there's there's just not much by way of refreshment and encouragement. And he said, I just long for you like I long for this place when I'm out living in the desert. And in Psalm 42, same concept. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? After David was here for a while, Saul comes up. As a Christian standing stone, it's a barren wilderness. We can't make it on our own. But the waters of En Gedi are fresh and flow with life. So find the Lord in prayer. Quench your thirst and end your strife. Oh, and Getty, taking refuge in the Lord, and Getty, let the peace of God reward, drinking living water and resting in the shade, finding all the comfort to never be. A quiet peace with God. Done by a man called Ray Vandalon, who is a kind of a hit. That's that's a good sign. Imagine that, because you know it was barren desert for for hundreds and hundreds of miles, and Dave, David was, you know, 
running from uh, an insane king trying to kill him. And then he comes to this place called En Gedi, where the rivers are flowing and, and, and you know, he writes that Psalm, Psalm 63. And also in Psalm 46, listen to this. Um, it says, God is a refuge and strength, a very help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains be cast into the sea. Uh, though the waters, therefore, roar and the trouble through mountains uh, shake with swelling thereof. And he, and he says, Selah, which means stop and just think about that. That's, that's a bad day when the earth is removed and the mountains are cast into the sea. Amen? But then he says this, there is a river. There's a river. In, 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 in your worst time, in your worst day, there is a river. There's a river which streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. And God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. So when you're going through life and, and things are hard and, and barren sometimes, there, there's still a river coming from the city of God that you can be refreshed in. And sometimes we have to, we have to get to En Gedi and, and let God refresh our spirits. And uh, life sometimes can be a wilderness, a dry and thirsty land. And its only water source is dead, stagnant water. Even the most enjoyable things in life can be dry and barren. You have to have a place to be refreshed by living waters of God from the heat of the dryness of the world. We need to spend time at En Gedi so you can be refreshed and be able to refresh others. You know, you can't refresh others unless you are refreshed in the Spirit of God. Jesus said in John 7:37, on the day uh, of the last feast of the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, that out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Praise God. Rivers of living water. We used to sing a song, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, splash, splash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well. And give to me that life abundantly. Try singing that with me. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, and give to me that life abundantly. Amen. You have a river of life. If you're born again this morning and, and, and the blood of Jesus has cleansed you from your sin and he abides in you, you have a river of life flowing in you. You just have to tap into it. And, and that's where you're, you're refreshed at. Even though life is dry and barren and, and a desert place, you, you have a place where you can go to. David said, Lord, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to that rock that's higher than I. And you could be refreshed in the midst of all the life's barrenness. Psalms 36, verse 7 through 9. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on your abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with your fountain of life 
in your light, so do we see the light. Water. <laughs> Praise God. How can we come into times of refreshing? Well, I'm glad you asked that. In Acts 3.20, it tells us plainly how to be refreshed. Acts 3.20. It says, repent, repent. Therefore, why do you want to repent? Therefore, be converted. You, you want to repent so you, you, you change and, and you don't do the same thing that you were doing before. That's what repentance means. It's, it's not something that you did just one time. It's a, it's a lifestyle that we have to do. We have to live. He says, repent and be converted. And uh, that your sins may be blotted out. When times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, yes. Oh, Acts 3.20. It actually starts in 19. Okay, 19. So, how many see an order here? What's the first thing you have to do? Repent. Repent. And what happens when you do that? You're converted. And then, and then your sins are blotted out. Your sins are blotted out. God forgives you of your sins. And then times of refreshing comes in. Times of refreshing. Hallelujah. And where does the refreshing come from? Presence. The presence of the Lord. Amen. Isn't that awesome? So repent. Be converted. That, that God will forgive you of your sin. And then what happens, times of refreshing comes into your heart and your spirit. I like that. And, and in James 4, 7, it says the same thing. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So you see that as we repent and we submit ourselves to God, we draw nigh unto him, he draw nigh unto us, and what happens? We get blessed. Now, why is that? John 1, 5, and I, this was a, a scripture I was meditating on. It says this, that God is light. And I thought about that. That's, God is light. And I just meditated on that for a while. God is light. God is light. God is light. Everybody say that with me. God is light. God is light. Pretty plain, isn't it? And... It says that God is light, and in him is zippo darkness. None. Nada. There is no darkness in him, and the Bible says, at all. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend because we came from darkness into light. And so we're trying, as, as Christians, we're trying to work out this darkness, you know, and it's a progress. Every day we're being changed from glory to glory and God's getting this darkness of the world out of us, but we're coming into the light. And the Bible says that he's called you out of darkness for the very purpose of bringing in you into this marvelous light. But God is different. God is light and in him is no darkness. I mean, we came from darkness into light, but God is just pure light. There's no darkness in him at all. So if we sin and we walk in darkness and God is light, who's got to change? <laughs> we do. Why? Because God is light. And if you want to have fellowship with him, you have to walk in the light as he is in the light. Isn't that good? 
So that's why the Bible says you have to first repent, get yourself right, get yourself cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and then you could have fellowship with God because He is light. <laughs> and some people, they, they walk in darkness continually, and they say, well, I just don't feel the presence of God. Maybe it's the worship team. Maybe it's the pastor. No, it ain't the pastor or the worship team. You're just not walking in the light as he is in the light. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and, and draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you and times of refreshing will come into your spirit. It doesn't depend on the pastor or the song leader. It's you repenting and walking in the light as he is in the light. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. In him is no darkness. And if, if we confess our sins, it's not when. You know, it's like if I walk to the back door and I fall down, I could get back up. But if I say when, I'll just keep throwing myself on the floor and getting back up. You know, it's not when I sin, but if I do. If I happen to miss the mark, which all of us do. How many went 40 miles an hour in that 35 mile an hour speed limit this morning? <laughs> if we sin, if we sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and fellowship with the, our brothers. Isn't that awesome? So if God is light and in him in his darkness at all, we have to walk in the light. Godly repentance is a lifestyle, not just a single act we did at the point of salvation. You know, I went down to this uh, old piney, log cabin church down and uh, out by Crown Winery. This uh, guy invited me to come down there and play music and, with him. And uh, it was an old log cabin. That, it was a church. And uh, it's probably been there a hundred years. And, you know, they, they had people got up and said, you know, I got saved in this log cabin, you know. Well, you know, and that was 40. I mean, I, I think I was the only one there that was under 90. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but but it, it was a good time. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it's not just when we first get saved is, is when we just repent. It's, it's a lifestyle. Every day there might be something that we miss the mark on and we have to have, ask God for forgiveness so we could walk in the light. So are you thirsty this morning? Do you feel like you're dry and barren? Do you feel like you need to be refreshed by the Spirit of God? The Bible says in, in Revelations, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, I mean, how many can identify with that? Come and buy and eat. This is Isaiah 55.1. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not of us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about the body of death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. The word for clay pots is, is a Greek word. It's agnisigo, I can't pronounce it, which really uh, literally means earthware. And it's, uh, it's the word that's used for describe plain, ordinary, run-in-the-mill pots. And that's what we are. We're earthware. I may have ever seen people 
these potters, these clay, they take a lump of clay and they make a pot. Well, that's all we are. We're all lumps of clay that God has has made us, and and this is our shell right here. But you have this, you have this treasure. Isn't that good? You have this treasure in an earthen vessel, which is the Spirit of God. And you have this treasure in an earthen vessel, in a pot of clay. And uh, I know that that's not very complimentary, but it's a good analogy of our lives, our, 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 our flesh. And uh, the Bible says that God formed us out of the dirt and the clay of the ground. We're all flawed and cracked in our humanity. Like clay pots were just baked. Some of them even, some of us are even half baked. But we're clay pots and, and God has put light in that. It says in, uh, it says, for we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. It says, in, for a light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So this verse has really spoke to me many times. Though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. And you know, the minute you're born, your outward man begins to perish. Some of us are further along in this perishing process. And, you know, I'm down the road a ways. <laughs> uh, but our outward man perishes. But the real person, the real you, is your spirit. Your body, soul, and, yeah, your spirit, your, your, your soul. And it says the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. So your outward man can become weak and frail and, and, and feeble, but yet your inward man is renewed and, and, and is getting stronger day by day. And I've known people who are very strong in the spirit, but their flesh is very weak. How many ever heard Joni Erickson Tata? I mean, she is a woman who was paralyzed, but she has ministered to thousands upon thousands of people from her wheelchair. She's, uh, she's paralyzed. Her spirit, she, she understands that her spirit is being renewed day by day. The outward man's going to perish, but the spirit is renewed day by day. And that's the real you, is your spirit. And I, and I know this for a fact because, you know, I experienced this when, when I almost died from anaphylactic shock. I, I seen the difference between the spirit and the, and the flesh. That your spirit is alive and it's totally separate from your body. And so you want to you wanna build up, you want to encourage, you, even in the midst of all kinds of dryness and barrenness in the world that we go through, your spirit can have joy and, and, and have refreshing times by the living waters of God. Even though our outward man is perishing, even though we're living in a dry and barren land, there is a river which streams make glad the city of God. Isaiah 41, 17, I just, two more scriptures. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open up rivers of, of barren heights and fountains in the midst of the valley. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and dry land springs of water. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? You might want to write that verse down, Isaiah 41, 17 through 18. And then in Revelations 22, 16, I'll close with this verse, 16 and 17. Jesus sent his angel to testify to you about the things 
uh, for the churches. He said, I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. And it says, the spirit and the bride said, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who thirsts come. And let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I'm going to have Scott play a song this morning. Yeah. And it's Isaiah 50, or it's Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart. David wrote that psalm after he sinned with Bathsheba. And maybe you need times of refreshing in your life. Maybe you've been going through a dry and thirsty land. The first thing you have to do is repent. Let the Lord speak to you this morning. And renew a right spirit within me. Yes. Hi. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Hi, thank you very much for watching Channel 798.